All right, look with me in Romans chapter 15, and let's talk about hope for our future. Hope for our future. Romans 15, starting in verse 13. Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. Because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God but by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will see understand. That's why I have often been hindered from coming to you, but now there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I've been longing for so many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to just speak to us from these scriptures. Lord, thank you for your people. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. I pray that we'd encounter you through the ministry of your word today. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. God bless you real good. (laughs) In 1942, the renowned psychiatrist and author Viktor Frankl and his family were detained in Austria and sent to the Nazi ghetto. A little while after, Frankel's parents were sent to Auschwitz, where they were killed in the gas chambers. Frankel's young wife died in the gas chamber at Bergen-Belsen. Frankel was sent to Dachau, where he was forced to work as the camp physician taking care of his Nazi tormentors. Frankel had been working on a book which represented the sum total of his life's work, his magnum opus, if you will. Before he was arrested, he sewed the manuscript of the book into the lining of his overcoat and prayed that he wouldn't be separated from it. Three days after he arrived in Dachau, all of his clothes were taken away from him, including his overcoat. And he was given the gray, tattered rags of a prisoner who had died before him in the gas chambers. Perhaps they had been worn by many prisoners. Frankel said that it was the absolute lowest moment of his entire life. There was nothing left that could be taken away from him. His family was gone. His home was gone. His career was gone. All of his dignity was gone. And his life's work was gone. But inside the pocket of the prison clothes, he he found a folded up piece of paper and he took it out and he opened it and it was a page torn out of a Jewish prayer book. It was the Jewish Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Frankel said something happened to him when he read that prayer. He concluded that it was more than a mere coincidence, but that God was challenging him not just to write down his thoughts on paper, but to live them. Hope was born in his heart. 
Frankel survived Dachau. He lived to be 92. He remarried. He had a family. And he wrote 39 best-selling books translated into 48 different languages. In his most famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankel wrote this. There is nothing in the world that could so effectively help one survive even the worst conditions as hope. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. We've been studying Paul's ministry since 2012. We've been studying his letters together since 2014. And one of the things that stands out to me most about Paul is his unquenchable hopefulness. We see it all over Paul's letters, and we see it again right here in Romans 15. You know, looking over the fruit of his life's work, Paul had none of the advantages that we have. At the time that Paul was writing this letter to the Romans, all of his churches were facing massive challenges. In Galatia, false teachers were trying to convince the Gentile Christians that they had to obey the Jewish law to be fully saved, and they were succeeding in convincing them. In Jerusalem, those same false teachers had convinced the Jews that Paul was blaspheming the Jewish faith all over the world. In Thessalonica and Philippi, the believers were under such intense persecution that Paul was deeply concerned that they weren't going to be able to bear up under it. In Corinth, the church was riddled with quarreling and divisions and immorality. In Rome, the Gentile Christians were unappreciative and insensitive and arrogant towards the Jewish believers who had actually founded the church. Along the way, Paul endured riots and beatings and arrests and imprisonments. He was stoned and left for dead. Some of his co-workers disagreed with him, defected from him. Now, we know how things panned out, but Paul had no such foresight. We know that the church would survive and not only survive, but thrive and change the course of human history. We know that Paul's letters would amount to one quarter of the New Testament, part of the best-selling book of all time, but Paul didn't know that. We know that Paul's lines would become some of the most celebrated words among men, but Paul didn't know that. We know that after Jesus Christ, Paul would become the second most influential man in modern history whose name would become synonymous with Christianity and known around the world by billions of people. But Paul didn't know any of that. As he dictated this letter to Tertius from his guest room in Corinth, Paul had nothing but challenges in front of him, and yet he was so full of hope for his future, and for ours. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Last week we shared with you from the first half of Romans 15 about building hope. God has called us to build an otherworldly environment that when people step into it, it gives them hope. God has called us to be an otherworldly atmosphere that when people step into us, that they realize that better is possible. Last week, I asked you to sign on joining us here to build a place of hope. But how do we know if we can really do it? How do we know if we'll be successful giving out hope? How do we know if we'll be able to give hope to millennials who especially need hope? Looking at the back nine of Romans 15 today, I see a few reasons to have hope for our future. And I want to share them with you this morning. Hope for our future. A few reasons from Romans 15. First of all, we have hope for our future because we have hope. Holy resources. We have hope because we have holy resources. Paul prays that God will fill us with hope by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. And that reminds Paul why he is so hopeful about us. It has nothing to do with us on our own. We don't have a really good chance, but it has everything to do with the resources God has given us. God has given us the precious Holy Spirit. Paul mentions the Holy Spirit four times in these verses. The Holy Spirit is what makes the church different from any other religious community or social organization or club on earth. The Holy Spirit is what makes us completely unique. He says here in these verses that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Do you know sanctified means that we are set apart especially for God. The Holy Spirit is the one who constantly reminds us that we are special to God. Once we were like everyone else on earth, but God has called us and God has separated us to belong to him. Paul says that God has placed the Holy Spirit as a seal over our heart. And that means that with every beat of our heart, the Holy Spirit reminds us, you are God's beloved. You are God's precious possession bought with a price. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. You are clean. You are God's son. You are God's daughter. He is your father. You are a co-heir with Jesus set to inherit all the promises of God. You are the apple of his eye. You are engraved on the palm of his hand. Absolutely nothing can separate you from his love. You are never forgotten. You are not forsaken. You are an overcomer. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You are destined to rule and to reign with him forever. The Holy Spirit as a seal over our heart reminds us that we are sanctified. We are no longer ordinary. We are extraordinary people. The Holy Spirit completes our knowledge and fills us with goodness. Paul says here, I am confident that you yourselves are full of goodness and complete in knowledge. Now, that doesn't mean that we automatically know everything there is to learn about God and the scriptures and the Christian life. What it does mean is that moment by moment in every situation, the Holy Spirit gives us on the spot knowledge of the will of God. Jesus talked about that. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and he would remind us of everything that Jesus said. Now, that doesn't mean that we have all the words of Jesus memorized verbatim. Actually, I went to Bible college with a kid who, by the time he was 19, had memorized the entire Bible. He, he became a Wycliffe Bible translator. We support him. He's a missionary in, in Chad, Africa, and we support him. But, uh, but I don't have the whole Bible memorized, not, not even by a long shot. But, but what it means is that in every situation we face, we intuitively know what Jesus would do because of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Paul said the Holy Spirit makes us complete in knowledge. That means whether we've been walking with the Lord for a week or for a year, or for a whole lifetime, the Holy Spirit fills in the gaps just when we need him to. Complete in knowledge means that we know the right thing to do at the right moment. And full of goodness means that we have the inner inclination and the strength to do it. Before we were in Christ, we didn't want to do the right thing. And even if we did, we couldn't. But now the Holy Spirit has produced in us the fruit of the Spirit called goodness, which is the desire and the ability to do what is right and pleases God. We have hope because we have holy resources. We have the Holy Spirit and we have each other. God has given us each other. Paul says, I am confident that you are competent to instruct each other. That word competent, I love it. It's the word dynamite. 
It's the word that the New Testament uses to describe the empowering of the Holy Spirit inside of believers. That word instruct means to counsel, to advise, to encourage. It literally means to take the truth of the word of God and to drive them deep into someone's heart. So this is what Paul is saying. I am confident that you are powerful in the Holy Spirit to help one another by ministering the word of God deep into one another's hearts. I want you to listen to this. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had another believer come along and at just the moment you needed, they've ministered the word of God to you that gave you life and strength and courage. Maybe it gave you much needed direction. Maybe it was even a word of warning. On Monday of this week, I went to see Rosalie in the hospital. And I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to read Psalm 91 to her and tell her to not be afraid. I didn't know till I met with her family on Thursday after she passed that Psalm 91 was her favorite psalm. On Wednesday, Pastor Faith went to see Rosalie and she didn't know that I read Psalm 91 to Rosalie, nor did she know that it was Rosalie's favorite psalm, but the Holy Spirit impressed her to read Psalm 91. See, what a beautiful double reassurance from the Lord for Rosalie and for her family. The Lord was with Rosalie in the final hours of her life. And the Lord is with her family now. I am confident that you are powerful in the Holy Spirit to minister the word of God deeply to one another. Last year, I took part in a funeral for a young husband who died under tragic circumstances. The morning of the funeral, literally, on my way out the door, literally, the Holy Spirit gave me two very specific scriptures. And they were words of real comfort, words of real reassurance of the faithfulness of God's love, even if we've messed up. The young man's widow got up to speak right after me, and the night before, the Lord had given her the exact same two scriptures. She was blown away. You see, the Holy Spirit was reassuring her that God was with her husband when he died and he was with her and her children now. I am confident that you are powerful in the Holy Spirit to minister the word of God deeply to one another. Aren't you so thankful that we have each other? I hope you are, because 5.30 Saturday and 8.30 wasn't. I hope you're thankful that we have each other. Aren't you glad that we're powerful in the Holy Spirit to encourage one another and to counsel one another and even to warn and correct one another? Aren't you glad that we're powerful in the Holy Spirit to have one another's backs? We have hope because we have holy resources. We have the Holy Spirit. We have each other. And God has given us anointed leaders to remind us and to prepare us to be received by God when this life is over. The the Holy Spirit, he sanctifies us. He completes our knowledge. He fills us with goodness. He empowers us to minister to each other. But Paul says here, we still need Christian leaders. We still need apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors, and teachers. We still need overseers, and elders, and deacons. Paul says, I wrote to you boldly on some points to remind you again of a few things, because God has given me grace to lead, to help you to become obedient, and to ensure that your self-offering to God is acceptable to him. Actually, in the original text, that word remind is repeated twice. He says, I wrote to you boldly to remind you and remind you. God gives grace to leaders. He appoints and he anoints leaders to remind us and remind us. One of our favorite vacation spots is Hilton Head Island in South Carolina, which is legendary for golf. Every now and again, to relax, I used to go out to hit a bucket of balls. Now, I never became a golfer because golf requires time, money, and skill, and I have none of those things. I don't don't have time, I don't have money, I don't have skill, I don't have any of it. But 
but I used to like to go hit a bucket of balls now and then, so I decided one vacation to hire a pro to coach me on my swing. And he said to me, I, I want to help you get the most out of your swing. And then he started reminding me and reminding me and reminding me. Set your stance perpendicular to your face. Tilt your ba body away from the target. Stay loose. Flex your knees, but not too much. Back flat. Head straight. Fix your grip. He reminded me and reminded me and reminded me. Finally, near the end of our time together, I managed to drive the ball once about 120 yards straight down the fairway. And the pro said to me, that was great. Whatever you did, do it again. I said to him, I can't do it again. <laughs> and so we started from the top, reminding me and reminding me. And that's just how God uses Christian leaders. They are appointed and they are anointed to remind us and remind us so that we get the most out of our swing. You see, our Christian lives are a self-offering that each of us are making to God. In Romans 12.1, Paul has already said to us, present yourself as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. And God uses leaders to make sure that the offerings of our lives are accepted by God on that great and final day when we stand before him. God has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Holy Scriptures. He's given us each other. He's given us grace-filled leaders. He's given us everything we need to succeed. All the wisdom, all the inner motivation, all the strength, all the discipline, all the encouragement, all the coaching, all the support. That's why even with challenges in front of him, Paul could write and say, I am confident about you. Hope for our future. A few reasons from Romans 15. Number one, we have holy resources. Number two, we have hope for our future because we have holy ambition for a holy mission. Right. Romans 15 gives us some awesome insight into what made Paul tick. Paul talks about his ambition to keep traveling ever westward from Jerusalem to preach the name of Jesus where his name had never before been heard. But I want you to listen to this. Listen, listen, catch this. Grab onto this with your spirit this morning. It wasn't the size of the need per se that compelled Paul, but it was the size of God's promises. This is good right here. Catch this, catch it. After God called Paul on the Damascus road, Paul went and he searched the word. And what he found in the word filled him with holy ambition. Paul found God's promise to Abraham in your seed, who in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, in your seed, all the nations of people will be blessed. Paul understood from what he found in the word of God that God promised that Gentiles from every tongue and tribe and nation would come to believe on Jesus. He wasn't fueled so much by the size of the need as the size of God's promises. He, he found God's promise given through the prophet Isaiah quoted here in verse 21. Those who were not told about him will come to see and those who have not heard will come to understand. Paul saw in God's promises a guarantee of success in spite of the size of the challenge. And he believed that absolutely nothing can stop the church or the gospel of Jesus Christ because God said so. Well, what, if we, what if we did that? Rather than thinking about our mission in terms of the overwhelming need, what if we started thinking about our mission in terms of God's certain promises? Do you know why we're called harvest time? It's because in 1983, when God called Pastor Tate here to start a church, he promised him that there was a harvest here in Greenwich, in Fairfield County, in Westchester County. Do you know why we're building a thousand seat sanctuary? It's because God gave Pastor Tate the number 1,000 specifically. And our deacons later came to understand that it was meant that our sanctuary would seat a thousand at a time. 
Do you know why we're building here on this property? It's because years before we even bought this land, one of our deacons had a word from the Lord that this was the place that God had carved out for us. We couldn't buy it back then, but years later, we bought it through a series of miracles. Well, what if, what if we had a paradigm shift in our thinking about our mission? What if we let God's promises fuel our holy ambition? There's a lot of people out there in Fairfield and Westchester County that need to hear the good news. There are a lot of millennials that need to hear the good news. But what if we focused on the size of God's promises instead of the size of our challenges? You see, Jesus didn't only say, from now on, I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said, from now on, you will catch men. Jesus said, you didn't pick me, but I picked you and I ordained, I foreplanned, I forepurposed it that you will bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth all the way to the ends of the age. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick. And they will recover. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Paul didn't know, but we know, that the church survived the Roman Empire. And it didn't just survive it, it took it over. The church survived the Ottoman Empire. The church survived the German and Austrian empires. The church survived the French and Spanish and Portuguese empires. The church survived the Prussian empire, the British empire. The church survived communism. I don't know. Do you think the church can survive the millennials? I don't know. You know, Holy Spirit's been giving church the creativity to reinvent itself for 2,000 years, but I think the Holy Spirit's met his match in the millennials. God said, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters, and they shall prophesy. What if God helped us to see like Paul in the magnitude of the mission, the magnitude of our opportunity? There are two million people in Fairfield and Westchester County that need to know Jesus. You know what that means? That means we're going to need a bigger building than phase two. The owner of a shoe company was getting ready to retire. And he was trying to figure out who to hand the business over to. So he called in his production manager and his sales manager. He said, I'm considering expanding our business to Africa. So I want you to both go over and explore the market and report back to me. He sent his production manager to West Africa. And he sent his sales manager further to East Africa. After a week, the production manager arrived home first. Shaking his head, he said, forget about the market in Africa, boss. Nobody wears shoes over there. <laughs> Two weeks later, the sales manager arrived home from East Africa. And he ran into the boss's office frantically, waving his arms. He said, boss, crank up production to maximum capacity right away. Nobody wears shoes over there. <laughs> the owner knew who to give the business to. And what if we, what if we started thinking like that sales manager? Rather than thinking that the gospel is something that nobody wants around here, what if we started thinking that the gospel is something that everyone around here desperately needs? Well, what if we started thinking the gospel is good for everyone because it is? What if we started thinking the gospel is something that can dramatically improve the quality of people's lives because it can? What if we started thinking that the gospel is a matter of life and death because it is? 
when we meet someone who doesn't know Jesus, rather than thinking of him as someone who probably isn't interested, what have we thought now? There's a man who needs a pair of shoes. May God give us holy ambition for a holy mission. And listen, you don't have to go on a harvest time missions trip to Africa or India. There are plenty of people right here who need shoes. At Easter, we had a man attend our services on Easter Sunday morning, a Wall Street guy in his late 50s. His mother was Catholic, his father was Jewish, and he was raised nothing. After Easter, I got a beautiful little handwritten note from him. He said to me, Pastor, thank you so much for your message. He said, no one ever explained the meaning of Easter to me before. Late 50s, never once had anyone told him what Easter is about. Now there's a man who needs a pair of shoes. And how many others are there like him? Hope for our future. A few reasons from Romans 15. We have hope because we have holy resources. We have hope because we have holy ambition. And finally, we have hope for our future because we have holy plans. We have holy plans. God put a holy plan in Paul's heart. It was logical. It was sequential. It was strategic. But beyond all of that, it was God's will. In Paul's day, people conceived of the Mediterranean Sea as a circle in the center of the earth. And Paul's plan was to work his way from Jerusalem all the way around the northern curve of the Mediterranean Sea. So far, he had made it from Jerusalem through Syria to Turkey to Greece. He made it as far as Croatia and Montenegro. It, it took him 25 years to get that far, but he was picking up speed now. His plan was to reach Rome and then at Rome to get resupplied by the church there to reach Spain, which was the ends of the earth in his day. It's possible that Paul's plan was then to jump the strait of Gibraltar to Morocco and start working his way around the southern curve of the Mediterranean Sea. Other apostles had gone from Jerusalem to Egypt and to Libya, and so it's possible that Paul was planning to work his way. We know he was planning to go all the way to Spain, and it's possible that he was planning to work his way so that the whole circle was completed. But here's the point. God had given Paul the plan, so Paul figured that God was going to keep him going, that God was going to sustain him and supply him until the plan was a success. Somebody said it like this. God put me here on this earth to accomplish a few things, and right now I'm so far behind, I will never die. Paul wrote, since by God's grace, we have received this ministry, therefore we do not lose heart. God called us to this plan and he didn't call us to fail. God called us to this plan and he didn't call us to achieve only mediocre results. God called us to this plan and he called us to finish and to finish big. Oh, it took a little longer than we thought. It took a little more sacrifice than we thought. It took a little bit more out of us than we thought. We have been pressured on every side, but we're not caving in. We have been set back on our heels a little bit, but we're not at our wit's end. We've been beat up a little bit, but we have never been abandoned. We have been knocked down, but we are never giving up. Someone listened to me this morning and received the word of the Lord. If God has given you a holy plan, then you have a reason to cling tenaciously to hope. When God called you to belong to Jesus, he gave you a holy plan. When God gave you your wife or your husband, he gave you a holy plan. Don't mess it up. 
When God gave you your children, he gave you a holy plan. When God gave you a chance to get an education, God gave you a holy plan. Someone listen, because I know this word is for someone this weekend to hear. When God gave you your job in New York City, he gave you a holy plan. Things might be taking a little longer than you thought. They might be a little harder than you thought. They might have taken some unexpected turns. Things might have taken a little more out of you than you thought. But you just hold on because I am confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to a completion. Therefore, we are always confident, very confident, I say. The one who has called you is faithful, and he will do it. Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We do not belong to the company of those who shrink back. No, we belong to those who have faith and are saved. Beloved, I have hope for our future. I have hope for my future and your future and our future together. God has given us holy resources and holy ambition built on his holy promises and he's given us holy plans. What you see taking shape outside, it's the result of plans that God gave us over 30 years ago. Everything we've done has been logical and sequential and strategic. But more than all of that, it has been the will of God. Oh, it's taken us just a little longer than we thought. But we're picking up speed now. It's taken us a little more sacrifice than we thought. Taken a little bit more out of us than we thought. But we have hope in God's sure promises. And that's why we will never give up. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, would you stand on your feet? Would you give Jesus a great big praise in this place this morning? Come on.